I'm Rich Terrapak, and I'm president of the CMC board this year. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to today's forum. Um, in case you haven't done so, Jane told you, asked you earlier to uh, turn off your cell phones or at least turn them to silence. You can keep, keep them on to the extent that you want to tweet. Uh, we encourage you to do so. Um, the hashtag is CMC Forum, and you can follow us at CMC at CBusMetroClub. Um, before we get going on today's program, let me uh, tell you what's coming up uh, next week. This is our month of forums focused on Columbus, which are supported, uh, all of them are supported by the Columbus Foundation. On November 16th, uh, our topic is Strengthening Central Ohio's Economy, the College Degree Imperative. Uh, good panelists, we've got uh, Gordon Broiler of the Ohio Foundation for Independent Colleges, Joyce Beatty, Senior Vice President, Office of Outreach and Engagement, the Ohio State University, and David Harrison, President of Columbus uh, State Community College, uh, is back the second time, I think, this year. And the panel will be moderated by Lisa Cordes, Executive Vice President of the Columbus Foundation. You'll want to sign up for next Wednesday, put it on your calendar, make a reservation, um, and uh, all of the upcoming forums can be found on the program. Uh, they can also be found at Columbus Metro club.org. Uh, take the program with you, put it someplace obvious so other people get to uh, see what's coming up and, and perhaps sign up as well. Bring them along. Um, we, it's always fun to introduce new members, and I believe we have one today. Anna Gangster? Gangster? I'm sorry. Is she here? Could you stand, please? <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Didn't look right. Anyway, the, uh, um, th th there are no doubt other guests here today. If you find, and you probably may have been here before, if you find this uh, something that you're interested in, it's uh, actually been quite a season so far and it will continue to be, uh, please uh, consider joining. Uh, there's an application on the back of, your, of the program. Um, and when you join, the first forum luncheon is on us. The, um, well, you have the program on your hand, look at the, at, on the back side, and you'll see the various companies that sponsor our programs. Sponsorship is about 50% of, of CMC's annual budget. And if there's anyone else that you think would like to be a sponsor, please talk to a member of the uh, CMC staff, uh, particularly uh, Jane, who will, uh, uh, can follow through on those things. Uh, the, uh, let's welcome the Foundation's Executive Director, a good friend, Doug Kreidler uh, to the stage to introduce the program. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Rich. Thank you for your uh, service on behalf of the A Better Columbus and, and to all of the board members of CMC and the staff, uh, a hearty congratulations. Um, Every month is uh, Columbus Month at, at CMC, but we felt that with this month of uh, particular focus on celebrating Columbus, uh, that we at the Columbus Foundation wanted to show our support and lend this additional support to help make this and these forums uh, even uh, more uh, spotlighted because we believe in a positive future for our Columbus, for our community. We also believe in an informed citizenry, which is what CMC stands for, is absolutely vital to building a, a, a brighter future for our community. Um, almost 10 years ago, I was asked to come and address the Columbus Metropolitan Club um, as I began my tenure at uh, the Columbus Foundation. And I, we put a questionnaire around each place. It had a few questions on it. We had you fill it out. We compiled it. And so when I took the stage, I had the results of it. One of those questions was about Check the box which best describes your sense of Columbus's future. Box one, Columbus has had a great run, but it's maturing as a city and its best days are behind it. Box two, Columbus has had a great run. Its best days are, the economy may be challenging, but the best days are ahead of it. Well, the results were astounding because as anybody close to elections, uh, uh, knows that a plurality of, say, a 60-40 is a huge plurality. Well, this wasn't 60-40. 
It wasn't 70-30. It wasn't 80-20. It wasn't 90-10. It wasn't 95-5. It was 100% chose the positive box. And I believe that a program like this and the programs that CMC do does every day or every week are such an important part of maintaining that optimism, or as I mentioned at TEDx last year, the inner go of our community. Because without the inner go, we won't continue to move forward. So hats off again to the Metropolitan Club for identifying this as an important discussion. The conversation today is about what we all want, a better community and a wide variety of individuals, what they believe we need to create a better Columbus. But I wanted to just mention that obviously your opinion matters on this, as does your action to pursue a better Columbus. And it's through forums like this and the article in Columbus Monthly that we help each other think and plan for an even better Columbus in the future. So with that, I'll just mention one other thing. Has anybody in the room not heard of the big give that starts tomorrow? <laughs> just check your emails. <laughs> And we at the Columbus Foundation are excited for our community to celebrate the importance of caring for others as we build a better Columbus for all. And we appreciate your interest uh, and enthusiasm about that. So it is with my privilege and pleasure to introduce today's panelists and moderator. Every five years since 1996, Columbus Monthly has asked the community, what does Columbus need? Columbus Monthly editor Ray Paprocki will be leading the discussion with several key people. Ray has been the editor of Columbus Monthly since May 2006. Collectively, Columbus Monthly and its 11 niche pu publications have served more than one, have earned more than 100 awards for journalism. Ray personally has earned more than 40. A journalism degree, uh, Ray has a journalism degree from OSU. He is published in the Chicago Tribune, AARP magazine. You're, too young for that, I can't imagine. <laughs> Probably a view from the youthful side or something. And among others, and has offered several books, please wel welcome Ray Paprocki, an explorer of truths. <laughs> Our first panelist launched Columbus Underground 10 years ago this month. How about a round of applause for a 10 year anniversary? <laughs> as an online resource for all things Columbus. In 2005, Columbus Underground was registered with the state of Ohio as a business entity offering advertising opportunities and expanding content to include politics, urban news, events, and online discussion. And today, it attracts about one million page views each month. Please welcome Walker Evans, a giver of voice. Our next panelist is well known in the community but has recently taken on a new role as the CEO of the Columbus Urban League. Prior to that, she was Vice President of Institutional Advancement at the Columbus College of Art and Design, always easier to say CCAD. Uh, her professional portfolio includes a wealth of experiences and leadership roles in government, amateur athletics, not-for-profit human services, public education, and higher education. She is an Olympian, an eight-year uh, member of the Columbus City School Board, a former press secretary. Let's welcome Stephanie Hightower, a very fast high-stepper, stepping up <laughs> once again. And our third panelist, has helped shape Columbus in many ways and in many places through his business MSI, which since its inception in the late 1970s has grown into one of the largest and most recognized landscape architecture and planning firms in the region. Under his leadership, MSI's well-known Columbus work includes the development of the Nationwide Arena District in downtown, the village of New Albany, and the Scioto Mile. Please welcome Keith Myers, a visionary of a better way forward. And with that, Ray, it's all yours. All right, thanks, Doug. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you, Walker, Stephanie, and Keith for being here. And I, I think this is great. I think this is a great uh, opportunity for us to continue the conversation about what Columbus needs. And I cannot think of a better partner than the Columbus Metropolitan Club, which 
play such an important role in this community. So thank you guys. I also want to acknowledge uh, a table here. Uh, there's the Columbus Monthly uh, staffers uh, joined by our new colleagues from the uh, various affiliations with the dispatch printing company. So thank you guys for being here. Okay, so today I want to uh, just give you some context about what we've been doing with what Columbus needs since we started and uh, then open it up to the panel for their responses. Uh, back in 1996, this idea popped into, uh, came forward to me, uh, what Columbus needs, just this phrase. And I said, hey, we can do something with this. So let's turn it into a survey. And um, we wanted to ask just a simple question. Uh, what do you think Columbus needs to improve itself? And we wanted to target audience, uh, people active in, in, in the community. Uh, from CEOs and public officials to grassroots level of neighborhood association presidents to people active in their various fields such as artists, architects, and such. So uh, back at that time, we uh, wrote letters, stuffed them in envelopes, sent them out, and hoped for a response. And we certainly got plenty of it. So we got enough that we, let me use this little, all right, it worked. Um, and we created a cover package out of it, uh, our first one, 1996. And so we came up with a top 10 list, and that's pretty much what our format has been since. And I just want to run through a little, uh, just a few of these as we go through each survey. Uh, number one in 96 for schools. At that time, very focused on Columbus Public Schools. Um, the, the phrase that was used that somebody wrote in was, it's the education system, stupid. And the, the focus was a lot on you know, uh, how to fix what was uh, ailing CPS at that time. Also a lot of talk about vouchers and even regionalization of, of, of schools. Uh, one topic that uh, we'll kind of chart through all the surveys is attitude adjustment. As you can see, we're, we're pretty high on the list at number three, uh, pretty much like a teenager who can't quite figure out what they feel like yet. Uh, transportation, uh, transportation at number six. Uh, was a, a lot about uh, getting uh, CODA to, to set up routes so people who needed jobs could get to where the jobs were. And then uh, sort of the wild card number 10, new geography. Uh, sort of a, a lament about no oceans, no mountains. Uh, there, was, there was one innovative uh, suggestion, I don't know how practical it was, but the, uh, the suggestion was to flood the city so we look more like Venice, Italy. So. <laughs> All right, so we move on to 2001. We have a new number one, downtown improvements. Uh, there's, there was a story that was uh, a response that came in was, you know, there's no place to eat after 10 or 10.30 at night. You know, we get, something has to happen downtown. Transportation moved up to number two. Just got to be better ways to move the masses. And number f uh, five, attitude adjustment kind of dropped down a few. Still a little inf inferiority complex happening. And another wild card, lose weight. This, if you remember back in, uh, at this time, there was a national survey. I think it was Men's Health. I could be wrong about that. But we were, Columbus was named the fifth fattest city in the United States. So, so that was on everybody's mind, apparently, to, to get in better shape. So we moved to 2006. We have a new number one again. This time it's transportation, working its way up the list. Um, one respondent uh, wrote in and said that, uh, you know, they have out-of-town guests. They come in and they ask, okay, where's the subway? Where's the light rail? They felt embarrassed about that. And a lot of other people did. We need to get uh, transportation issues tackled. Uh, downtown is still number two. School's still in the top three. Crime gets on the list for the first time. Attitude drops all the way to number 10. We must be feeling better about ourselves. So then we come to this year, 2011. And for those who haven't seen the list yet, I'm going to try to inject a bit of drama with a little countdown here. <laughs> all right, so you can even count down with me if you'd like. But all right, number 10, embrace diversity. This is of all kinds, including more women in leadership roles. Better ways to market the city, get the message out. Let's get greener, especially that Scioto River needs to get cleaned up downtown. Uh, figure out to, how to consistently support the arts. Attitude adjustment, back up to number five. Looks like we need a collective group therapy session. And then we need more stuff to do, uh, such as a high altitude restaurant, was uh, a couple of people's suggestions. And then uh, 
like the old One Nation, and then education, but it's broader than public, uh, Columbus Public Schools. Um, a lot more focus on the broader range of pre-K all the way through college. And so then we get to number three and number two, more jobs, regional cooperation and attracting and retaining employers. Downtown, still number two, a lot of people happy about all the changes. You know, key, what Keith has done with the Scioto Mile and, and the Commons, but it's not enough, has been, was the message. And number one, by an overwhelming margin, was still transportation. And this time, it was really quite broad. It was everything you could think of. Light rail, urban streetcars, rail systems, trolleys, connections from east into downtown, from downtown to Port Columbus. Speaking of Port Columbus, why not more flights? Why not international flights? Don't forget about the bicyclists. Don't forget about the pedestrians. Don't run them over when they're crossing the street. So that was our top 10 list. And with every time we do this, there are always um, <laughs> some other ideas that are a little more. F is, is that the one you're talking about there? All right. Um, that don't make the top 10, but are just sort of out there, uh, including a Turkish bathhouse, a beer garden at the Ohio State Fair, a new downtown skyscraper. Um, and this. I like this one uh, just because I think it could, it could actually maybe happen. Uh, this is from Jenny Britton Bauer at Jenny's Ice Cream. Uh, statues of famous people from Columbus and Central Ohio placed in parks and near sidewalks throughout the city. But they're not the usual suspects. These are people like the, the rapper Bow Wow, uh, the actress Beverly D'Angelo, um, the underappreciated saxophonist Roland Kirk, and the singer Dwight Yoakam. I think it would be very cool to just walk down the street and have people stop and read about them folks that we normally don't think about being from Columbus. Oops, going the wrong way, sorry about that. All right, so if you didn't respond to our survey, that's okay, you still have a chance. Go to columbusmonthly.com, we'll take your comments uh, and post them so everybody can continue the conversation. Um, so that's what we've been doing. Now I'm, I'm very curious in what our panelists have to say. Um, first, I'd like to just throw out a broad question for you guys. Uh, just a response to the top 10 list now, or any, any of the top 10s before. Uh, just your overall reaction and your thoughts to the, to the top 10 that we have. And we'll just go down the line, and then I'll come back and ask you for your own specific thoughts on what Columbus needs. So Walker, if you don't mind. Sure, um, I, I was surprised, uh, well, I guess not surprised, but thrilled to see transportation at the top of the list in, in multiple years. Uh, it's something I feel really strongly about. Not only, um, you know, like you mentioned before, our lack of uh, rail infrastructure, but um, uh, an improved system for bike friendliness throughout the city, focus on renovating our streets with a complete streets uh, mindset. Um, you know, I, I think that sort of thing is uh, it's, it's one of the things that the city can do from an infrastructure standpoint that uh, citizens can't do on their own. You know, I, I think a lot of the other things on the list, um, people are capable of going out and doing, but this is one thing where you really need strong leadership at the city level, the county level, the state level to kind of step up to the plate. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I thought it was fascinating that, um, and, and somewhat a little um, discouraging that education on schools um, has moved down on the list how it started off in 96 as you know the, the, the number one schools. And even though it, it's broader this time around, but it's down to number four this year. So you know, I think this is one of those issues. We all know that education is the equalizer. Um, and um, I, I would have liked to have seen it stay a little bit higher. I'm, I'm just a little worried that it keeps moving down um, every, every four years. <coughs> I thought the... Um the attitude adjustment was interesting, how it was all over the board. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's any secret we suffer from um, a tre tremendous deal of Midwestern modesty in Columbus. And I've lived in, um, grew up in Cleveland, lived in Cincinnati for a while. And, and um, uh, Cleveland, while it may suffer from a kind of communal depression, um, you know, Cincinnati is just the opposite. There's no, no lack of swagger there. And, and um, it's, it's, it was always interesting to me that um, Columbus, which has um, tremendous advantages over both those cities, 
um, never really felt what I think what the mayor call, calls you know the swagger that um, I think frankly we're entitled to. So. Now, for your each, uh, if you could share, if you don't mind, your own uh, what you think Columbus needs to improve itself, you come up with at least one, two, or three. Yeah. There. Well, th this is sort of a take on one of the responses, and um, having having read through the. Uh, the print article, and, and to dispel any rumors, I do know how to read things in print format. <laughs> um, the the w one of the one of the, kind of the standout quotes was from Alex Fisher saying that we need a new uh, skyscraper downtown. And knowing Alex, I think he'd appreciate me calling him out for the sake of discussion. But I would have to disagree with that. Um, you know, we we have a neighborhood like uh, the Arena District that was built uh, over a, a larger area. It's essentially its own neighborhood downtown. I, I think that development could have been stacked into one skyscraper by itself. It could have been a one billion dollar skyscraper, and while it would have made our postcards look a little bit nicer, um, it really doesn't. It, it wouldn't have done as much for that uh, pedestrian vibrancy that, that you get the, in the Arena District, where you've got dozens of restaurants and things to do and, and shops and you know all, all of that sort of thing. So I would say what we need downtown more than a new skyscraper is another Arena District or another another built out neighborhood of six to eight story buildings where you get a lot of that vibrancy that you can live in on the street. Is there anywhere in particular that you see that possible? Um, have to talk to Keith about that one. <laughs> uh, he, uh, MSI has done a really great job with the, uh, the 2010 downtown development plan last, last year. And I, I've been really excited about the portion that um, covers the, the sort of creative campus, the area around CCAD, Columbus State, there's huge swaths of surface parking lots over there that you could build three new neighborhoods on, I, I think, over the next 10, 20 years. Keith, are, is that going to well, happen? I, <laughs> yes. I hope so. Um, I think the other thing working for that particular area is we, ha we have probably one of the best parks downtown, um, the Topiary Park. Uh, that park would cost 10 or $15 million to build the day. And, um, there's a lot of surface parking lots that, that frankly surround it. So I think there's tremendous opportunity in and around um, that entire area. <clears throat> Having said that, I think, you know, back to your original question on the, on the list, um, the, the transportation, it's interesting, isn't it? That's, that's number one. Um, and we've had sort of debates about transportation here recently with streetcars coming and going and, and discussions about the future of High Street. <clears throat> And I think coming to some resolution um, on, the, on the transportation issue is critically important to the city uh, being competitive into the in, in the future. And we have to do it, I, I don't think we can just look at what other cities have done and try and emulate that because we live in a different time now than, than when cities develop their systems and things. We need to look at a system that's right for Columbus and right um, for the time that we're in right now. We may not be able to afford um, everything that that all these other cities that some of these other cities have done um, but we have to find a way to make it happen uh, you know, the one thing and I, by the, the way to do that I suspect is by looking at what assets that we have and finding different ways of using them I was interested um, a number of years ago I asked somebody in my office to, to tell me just how many acres of land um, the interstate occupies in downtown Columbus? And <coughs> if you think about it, you know, it's 350 acres of land um, is covered by the interbelt. I mean, if you think of how much land um, between 270, 71, 315, how much land is publicly owned and, and really dedicated to one single mode of transportation, um, it makes you wonder if there's not another way to utilize that or at least to piggyback on um, to what we already have um, to, to create a better transportation system than we have today. And I, I just, I think it's imperative that we think differently um, than perhaps other cities have done and, and, and perhaps what we've contemplated in the past. Stephanie, what about you? What do you think? You know what, I, I want to underscore what, what Keith has just mentioned as it relates to transportation. Um, as it relates to jobs in this community and <clears throat> for those uh, individuals who um, we're looking at placing in jobs and you're looking at a lot of those corporations that are moving out to the outer belts, um, if we can't get those individuals to those jobs, 
um, then we're not going to be able to attract, I think, businesses. And so there's, <clears throat> in my role at the Urban League, as we look at workforce development issues, the transportation piece is one that is critically important to us um, as we look at how can we <clears throat> not only get people ready for jobs, but then how are we going to get them actually to those jobs. And as we develop programs, we're having to look at building our own sort of transportation system, which is not a part of our mission and it's not what we do, but in order for us to be able to have successful programming, we've got to be able to transport those individuals to jobs. So I agree with Keith, the transportation piece is very critical, I think, to our future growth and expansion and attractiveness as a city. Yeah, Stephanie, I, I think when in the survey, and you, you participated in, we appreciate that, one of the things to, to piggyback on what you just said was that, uh, you, was that Columbus needs a more diverse workforce or, or appreciation of one. Or if you could elaborate on that, please. Well, you know, I, I think that if this city wants to be attractive to uh, large corporations, if we want to be able to attract young people to stay in this community, um, and, and women in particular, um, I think we've got to look at <clears throat> creating a culture in the business community that really uh, appreciates uh, diversity and um, really starts to look at um, themselves internally and look at uh, women in leadership positions, um, look at um, the uh, different ethnic groups um, that are in um, their corporations and in leadership positions. Um, when we look at um, you know, a lot of our leaders in this community, uh, we don't have a lot of women that sit um, on major corporate boards. Um, we don't have a lot of, 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 of uh, diverse uh, minorities um, that sit on boards or are in leadership positions in this community. So I think that's one of those things that we, if we want to be attractive um, to uh, large corporations and bringing businesses, um, we know that diversity, and you look at most of these co uh, uh, larger corporations and companies, diversity and inclusion has become uh, one of the stellar pieces of what their culture is all about. And I think we've got to embrace that, and the business community has to embrace that more. Um, you know, I am the first woman CEO of the Columbus Urban League um, in its 97-year um, um, history, and I think that across the board is one of the things that is happening and has happened in this community that because we haven't br embraced diversity, you know, you just have in 2011 the first woman CEO of, of, of the Columbus Urban League. Have you seen any other signs of progress that you see where, where things are maybe getting better or at least the awareness of trying to get better? Um, you know what, I've only been in this position for a short <laughs> period of time so I haven't really been able to evaluate it but I'm hoping that in time, you know, through, um, you know, um, um, organizations like you know the uh, y, um, YWCA and the Women's Fund um, that we can begin to create that kind of dialogue and form as it relates to women in leadership positions and again as in my new role um, I'm having lots of conversations with the corporate community as it relates to diversity and inclusion and how they can become a part of the Columbus Urban League and so that is encouraging that a lot of our major corporations in this city um, are actually embracing that and want to rely on the Columbus Urban League to assist in those efforts. Uh, Keith, I think in your uh, responses to us, uh, public art and public funding of art um, or, or, or some model of funding for art were on your list. What, uh, yeah, can you talk that was, about those and, more? It's probably topical, but because um, we've you know, done two parks downtown the riverfront and um, really you know, I think if we had a failure at all, it was, you know, we just didn't, didn't manage to get significant pieces of public art really funded or built in, in either one of them. And um, it, part of it is, um, you know, the process in Columbus for um, developing funding, developing the funding model for public art and the process for actually procuring it. Um, one thing I've learned um, through those two exercises is that um, there's no shortage of uh, volunteer curators for public art and, 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 <laughs> and, and, um, uh, and they come from every um, from every angle uh, and no shortage of opinions but but I really think it, it is important um, public arts an important part particularly in a downtown area but throughout a city to, to creating its identity and um, and it's it's part of um, the uh, young group of people that we'd also like to see kind of make a home here um, supporting our local creative community. Speaking of the creative community, Walker, I don't know if that's an issue you want to address some about that topic of supporting the arts, the importance, why, why is it's, it's been a consistent 
um, need uh, in the survey, and I wonder if you could address that, why the importance of it. Sure, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things I think that's sort of in transition right now. I, I think historically fu funding the arts, uh, a lot of time was probably talking about the arts institutions and that sort of traditional model to go about doing that. Um, but with sort of the rise in uh, different ways to support smaller arts organizations through online campaigns, um, you know, the, the different model emerging and the different types of uh, leadership that's emerging from those uh, smaller organizations, I think, is beginning to become more and more significant. Um, I, I think in the past, uh, on occasion in Columbus, uh, one of our problems has been that we um, we put all of our eggs in one basket. We're looking for that, that one big thing that's going to put us on the map or that one big project that just can't fail. Um, and then when it does fail, it, it really hurts our ego and our, our swagger. <coughs> and, um, you know, we, we don't have a, a, cultural, a, a culture of accepting failure too well. And I, I think with um, sort of the creative class, the, the entrepreneurial community, there, there's a growing mindset behind you know, let's try, instead of one big thing, let's try 100 little things. 75% of them fail, the other 25% are a success, and that's a win for our city. So I, I think within that uh, class, just, you know, outside of supporting it in, in of itself, I think learning from that mindset is going to be really important to, to moving forward with the city. Yeah, I find it interesting. We, we did a story in October that uh, was about sort of a grassroots independent arts organizations, just these arts collectives, and there were like 70 some that were still in existence. And it seemed to be, I don't know if it was inspired by or whatever, the sort of the shadow box model of we'll make it on our, you know, on our, our receipts or however we bootstrap it. And, and it's all this sort of merging of, you know, this group works with this group and, and it's, uh, I find that very exciting uh, different way of looking at how the arts influence a community. Um, uh, I'm wondering if uh, you guys can talk also about some topics that are not in the top ten. Um, some of the other ideas, anything that you found surprising or that you thought was a really good idea that could actually be implemented, um, such as the Turkish bathhouse, for instance. <laughs> Uh, why don't we start with Stephanie and, and Keith and then Walker? You know, I love the idea of the youth programming. You know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm old school, and you know, there was a time I'm I'm a military brat, and um, when I lived on military installation bases, there were all there was always some kind of youth programming that was available for us, um, and it was year round, and it was a way that kept us engaged. Um, they were educational in nature. Um, and they were athletic in nature, but it kept us engaged and it kept us just out of trouble. Um, and there was always adult supervision, and um, I just think that's something that we should really take a look at in this community. Uh, youth programming, you know, we have a lot of young people, especially year-round, um, who need um, some assistance, whether it be educational, whether it be just to have some place to go. And I don't think we've really polled our youth in this community and really asked them what they need. We always, as the adults, <clears throat> we think we know what they need, but we really haven't asked them. And I would like for us to really take a look at that. And I know everybody's probably sitting there saying, oh, here we go, another public funded kind of thing. But at the end of the day, if we want to be able to develop the kind of edu educational system um, and the kind of cultural system in the city, we've got to begin to begin to educate and keep our kids engaged. And I just think that was a wonderful idea that someone threw, up, that threw out there. Um, I, I don't know. There's, uh, there's probably a lot of things <laughs> to, to, to address in that. But um, and the one thing that, that I've thought about for a long time is um, uh, just the idea of, of creating some kind of a um, uh, an open space fund or um, uh, having a fund that that allows you to sort of um, capture opportunities when they exist um, years ago um, you know I live out in Granville and years ago um, we put an open space ordinance on the on the um, ballot to, to just you know we thought if we're going to affect change that we had to be a player and it, it barely passed the first time we bought some property in the it's passed almost, well, it's passed every single time since, but it's been renewed about four or five times. The, um, the gist of it is, there, you know, we bought 1,500 acres um, out there, and 
you know, if there is a way that um, there is there is a sort of a public funding for that could act as an agent of change, where you have opportunities that exist, uh, like um, you know, it comes to cleaning up the river, or opportunities that may exist downtown, or even later on, um, where I think we're going to run into problems um, with some not first ring but second ring uh, suburban areas. You know, we've seen some of that at, at Morse Road, and, and there may be others. You know, that emerge on the horizon. If anyone's been out to um, uh, Tussing Road lately, um, you, you understand what I'm talking about. There's mm -hmm. there, there's a there's going to be a real issue um, in in a lot of American cities, but in Columbus with that that sort of second ring out, um, and you know what. The, what, what we do with that and, and how we sort of turn the sort of marginal real estate, um, what some people are calling red fields now, where they're, you know, they're operating right on the margin and, and they're difficult to use, and how do you turn them, and what do you do with that big Columbus Square shopping center? They've knocked all the buildings down, the pavement's still there. How many years is that going to sit there like that? Mm -hmm. And it's going to take, take some kind of creative um, strategy that some funding may be useful for in helping to, to turn that around. I the last thing I'll say about that, was, and it's, it's just in my mind because I went to this conference um, last week and there was all these professors from Georgia Tech who were pretty full of themselves um, because they discovered a, uh, a new idea, okay, they, they were going to, um, they were all about um, turning red fields into green fields, okay, and, and their idea was what you do is you take these marginally operating real estate and um, you knock it down, turn it into parks, and then you get the real estate value that happens on the edge of the parks and you redevelop it. And they, they had sites all around Atlanta and they were gonna completely turn Atlanta, turn Atlanta around with this new idea that they developed. And you know, this is, this is part of our Midwestern modesty. I mean, they didn't know anything about Columbus, but I, I was gleeful when I informed them at the end of the conference that, you know, that's a really terrific idea you guys came up with. We just did it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know how it works for you in Atlanta. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll share uh, one sort of specific idea and then one just sort of vague one as well. Um, one, of, one of the ideas that was on the, the 2010 downtown development plan that really stood out to me, um, and I'm not a sports guy at all, I don't, I don't really follow sports, um, was a downtown field house. So sort of a, a place um, where indoor soccer leagues, uh, you know, games could be held, gymnastics, uh, maybe an indoor pool, something that the community could have ac access to, sort of like an adult uh, rec center on steroids. Uh, at least that's the way I'm, I'm sure, not literal steroids. But, um, but, no tattoos either. <laughs> right. Um, but, but something that could also be monetized through the use, uh, you know, by, by the convention center where we already have a lot of cheerleading competitions and volleyball tournaments and things like that. I, I thought that was a really uh, a great idea and something that the community could really get behind. Um, but more vaguely speaking, n neighborhoods was on the list and I, I would argue that we already have a lot of great neighborhoods in Columbus. Um, the issue I think we have is that a lot of them are very heavily residential neighborhoods. So if you don't live in a specific neighborhood, you probably have very little reason to go visit that neighborhood or, or care about investment in that neighborhood. So I, I think if we sort of redefine how we continue to grow our neighborhoods and develop them, if we can give each of them or, or strengthen what's already there um, that appeals not only to residents that live there, but the rest of the community as a whole, um, you know, I, I don't live in German Village, but I love taking my kids to Schiller Park because it's a, it's a unique resource that only exists in that neighborhood. And I think, you know, from Eastmore to Westgate to Beechwald, you know, that there needs to be more, more of those things to do in those neighborhoods. All right, I've got another question or two, but I just want to uh, remind folks that uh, in just in a couple minutes we'll open the uh, forum up to questions. So if you can start thinking about what you'd like to ask, uh, we'll get to that shortly. Um, this question is looking forward. Um, let's say five years from now, maybe if we do this survey again, but wh what would you like to see the improvements in, say, downtown? Five years from now, what would you like to see have, have happened over five years? Uh, I'll dive in. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, it was interesting when we did the downtown plan. Um, we learned a lot when we went out to the public meetings, and uh, you know, to, there, we, we had we had some ideas of what we would hear. But I, I have to say that the one thing that surprised me more than anything else was um, was the discussion about High Street. 
Um, we, we really didn't, I mean, we knew about, we had some things at High Street. It wasn't really on our radar screen, you know, in, in a big way. But when, when we went out to the public meetings, um, people were nostalgic about Broad Street. They were just flat angry about High Street. And, and, you know, High Street's a problem. And it's our biggest, most important, it's not our biggest, it's our most important street, um, arguably. It's the, been the commercial street. It's a fascinating street. If you ever want an interesting Saturday, start on the south end and drive it all the way up to Worthington uh, through all the neighborhoods. It's a great thing to do. It's, it's potentially a terrific street and, and something that um, uh, is important to Columbus and to what Columbus is. And um, I think we have to, in the downtown area, we have to find a way to get High Street back. Mm. I, you know what, I, I would love to see more green space downtown. That's what I would love to see. I think to your point about um, the sea of parking lots um, that is downtown, I would love for us to figure out um, how we can have more green space downtown. And particularly um, in some of the neighborhood, urban neighborhood areas. I, I just love to see a continuation of what's already going on right now. I mean, um, in six months, we'll have a new grocery store downtown. Liz Lesnar's opening a new tiki bar right next door to it, um, which, which is awesome. No Turkish bath, though. It's <laughs> close, close. You can maybe pass it off as a Turkish theme. Um, you know, Neighborhood Launch is developing their condo development, so that's continuing to progress. So there's a lot of little things that I don't think, you know, maybe they aren't as standout on their own as, uh, you know, a new rail system or something like that. But if, if, if we continue to move in the same uh, sort of trajectory that we're on right now, I think just a lot of those little things will give people small individual reasons to spend more time downtown. All right. And then the last question, now off the hook, and we'll open it up. Uh, same theme, future, five years, but our, tar, our top need on this list, transportation. Well, would you like to see progress made um, in the transportation arena in the next five years? I'm not sure if five years is quick enough to, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to make too many changes, but um, you know, one, one of the other things discussed in the, in the 2010 downtown development plan was the, uh, the road diet project for Broad Street. Um, I think Keith had his team measure uh, Broad Street compared to 315, and yeah. 315 was what, like? Three feet bigger. Three feet bigger than Broad Street. <laughs> so, you know, we, we've got these uh, streets that, that are, were built, you know, and, and reconfigured in the past to kind of serve um, uh, our, our rush hour traffic. You know, they, they efficiently get people in and out of downtown during the one hour in the morning, one hour in the evening. Uh, five days a week, but the other 80% of the time, you know, they're, they're way too large, they're dead space, you know, especially on a, a Sunday afternoon, you can go lay down on Broad Street and not, uh, not get run over. So I, I'd love to see, but don't try that, don't, <laughs> don't, don't hold me accountable if you do get run over. Um, I, I'd love to see some progress made on those, either redefining how we use those spaces, whether it's bike lanes, whether it's more on-street parking, uh, medians, you know, decorative uses, green space uses. I, I, I'd love to see more progress on that in the next five years. Okay. Stephanie? I'd, I'd like for us, again, going back to the jobs issue, you know, look at what our current transportation system looks like, um, in particular our bus system, and see how we can improve upon that so that it extends itself um, into some more areas so that we can get people to jobs. First, Keith, I'd like to know which intern did you send out to 315? <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't that mean. We did it with <laughs> um, You know, I'd like to jump on the transportation thing, but we've been talking about it a lot, so I, I'll throw something different. That, you know, we offered 12 ideas as part of the downtown plan, and, and um, we thought they were all pretty equal, but it, it became clear to us right away that um, it was like one big idea and, and you know, 11, 11 dwarfs. And the, the big one was to take out the Main Street Dam um, downtown and restore the flow of the river. Um, and that got an awful lot of attention. And I think within five years, um, there's, there's a lot of, um, uh, there'd be a lot of momentum or a lot of, there'd be the least the possibility of getting that done. And, and you create an additional 33 acres of parkland. Um, in the downtown core, we create our own central park, and it would be mm. as big a game changer in the downtown as um, as what happened in '31 when Frank Packard and a few others uh, flipped the Civic Center from the 08 plan to what we have today. 
All right, great, thank you. Uh, now for questions, I have to read a little disclaimer here first. Uh, the Metropolitan Club um, records all of these forums for televised broadcast on ONN, uh, streaming on CMC's website and the Columbus Metropolitan Library website. If you have a question, please go to the microphone, introduce yourself and ask your question. And I always love this little part, and we thank you in advance for not making long editorial comments. <laughs> <laughs> Our first question, please. Yeah, I'm Beth Berkmer <clears throat> with the Central Ohio Transit Authority. And um, I know that transportation is a hot topic with everybody, even beyond the young professionals. Um, and, and rail has been really hot for the past few years. Um, what do you think about the possibility mm -hmm. of bus rapid transit? I know that mm -hmm. rail can be a huge investment in infrastructure, and, and, and that, that's something we have to consider with taxpayers. And thanks for all of your support. We're expanding. Yay. <laughs> but um, anyway, so bus rapid transit, what do you think? Do you know about it? And what do you think of it as a potential predecessor to rail, kind of mm -hmm. like a test run up the Northeast Corridor? That's what we're looking at right now. Any thoughts on that? I'm there, so however we can help. <laughs> <laughs> Call it in. Exactly. Let us know. We have two meetings actually tonight, tomorrow night, coder.com. All right. <laughs> but yes, we would love to hear about it. Let us know. Well, I think when it's done really well, uh, the infrastructure that goes into a bus rapid transit system can revitalize, you know, almost as well as what rail systems do. Um, Cleveland, for example, recently installed their um, Euclid corridor, I believe they, they call it, their, their bus rapid transit system. And there's been a lot of development, you know, kind of springing up along that line. Um, I'm going to forget which city, is it Bogota that has like one of the Bogota, largest? Bogota, Colombia, there's all throughout PRT Latin systems. America. Yeah, so th there's a lot of uh, really good examples of how that can really work. And uh, I mean, yeah. if Pittsburgh you build it. Pittsburgh and Boston, you can yeah. check out Pittsburgh and Boston, they have it, so. I'm familiar with it in Pittsburgh. I think it's, uh, it has to be on the table right now. Um, yeah. I, I think that the, um, the 500 million plus or whatever it would take to build a light rail line from Worthington to downtown is is more than we can afford. So rather than sit here and do nothing, um, mm -hmm. which sounds boring, um, it, it's it's something that we have to consider. I will say how we do it becomes critical um, and where it goes. And it's important that the first runs be successful. And I know Northeast Corps, I think, is one that's a good one. I think bus rapid transit from the airport to downtown would be helpful, mm -hmm. um, you know. And we can use some of that extra freeway land that I talked about earlier. So. <laughs> All right, thank you. I, I wanted to pick up on the theme that Keith just touched on of um, multiple functions out of uh, one set of investments. A number of the things on the list are potentially alignable and could be um, solve both budget problems and our need for improvement at the same time. So there's a whole area called green infrastructure, which is beyond complete streets um, and, and could provide, can provide green space, can handle stormwater management issues that otherwise are extremely expensive. I'm just sort of touching on a couple of points. But I wonder if what Columbus might need is a group of a think tank maybe that would look at integrative possibilities and ways that we can get more bang for our buck out of the things that we have to do anyway, get more things done faster. Just like to hear your reaction to that. The, um, first of all, the green infrastructure, I think we're actually, this is something we should crow about. You know, in terms of cities in the Midwest, I think we're, we're doing pretty well. Um, but I, I whether it's a think tank or it's a group of people or you know, the leadership trying to think about um, transportation and green infrastructure and some of these things that, that could happen um, simultaneously, it, the, the big thing is how do you come up you know, with what are the ideas for funding and, the, and, and those kinds of things. And I think we, it's possible that we could sort of think outside the box a little bit. You know, that, um, the one idea that we're kicking around is in a planning class last week is, you know, look, um, we, we have, uh, if you just simply taxed surface parking lots in the region, not the ones downtown, all of them, okay? If you think about the number of parking spaces in Polaris alone, you, you could begin to pay for some transit systems 
uh, pretty easily. And we all know, because you know, we all work for, you know, at least I do, work for retailers where you know, their idea is, they, they, but in, they don't build um, parking lots, surface parking lots, particularly in the outer reaches, um, for uh, the day after Thanksgiving. They build it for well above the day after Thanksgiving because their strategy is they want you to drive in that parking lot and always look like there's a parking space you know, all the way around you. So we have acres and acres, hundreds of acres, thousands of acres perhaps, of asphalt that essentially um, never gets used. Mm -hmm. and, and there's no um, incentive for them to do anything but that. Um, but if you thought differently, if you were willing to think differently and say, you know what, um, we're not going to, you know, the, the Pittsburgh, Texas, the parking space is downtown. That's ridiculous. That just takes downtown and puts it at a bigger disadvantage than it has already with the fact that it's, you know, you're limited in land and, and parking's an issue in the transit system um, they're working on. So, you know, you have, to, um, you have to kind of think a little bit differently about it. And one way to do it is to sort of level the playing field. Thank you. Morning. I'm jo well. Afternoon now, I guess. I'm Jody with Consider Biking. Thrilled to see transportation as one of the top needs, and I, uh, my question is about a public bike share. But I just also want to say Consider Biking is one of the charities in the Big Give. So if you can, if you, if you <laughs> care about downtown bike lanes, that's one of the initiatives that we're trying to advocate for. So another initiative that we're looking at is could Columbus sustain a public bike share system? And that's not mm -hmm. saying publicly funded, saying it's something that basically would be public bikes. And um, you know, do we have the infrastructure, the need? I think Columbus sometimes suffers from analysis paralysis. And you can look at this and say, you know, something could happen, somebody could get hurt, somebody could damage the bike. Can we accept that and still say this is something that we're an innovative enough city that this is something we could sustain and support? And so that's my question. Do, can, could, are we, could we do a bike share here? Uh, possibly. And this is something you and I have talked about on Columbus Underground <laughs> yeah. previously. Um, I, I think a lot of cities that have bike shares that work really well have higher levels of tourism or you know more more tourist traffic. Like DC, yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So so people come in, they don't have a bike with them, they want to get around easily by bike. You know, they they take part in these programs. I, I'd be interested to see if we could change that model to maybe focus on our our high student population. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe kids come here to go to Columbus State, CCAD, OSU, you know, what, whatever school in the region. Um, and maybe they don't have the funds to buy a bike, or maybe they don't, they don't have one, but they could take part in this, this type of program. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I would say you know, something sh should be usable here. It would just be what, what, what sort of changed audience would, would use something like that. Right. Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> Hi, I'm Bill Lafayette, Regionomics. Um, I'm really glad you brought up the issue of diversity. And I think it's very important, especially given the fact that that's one of the things that we like to tell people who don't live here, that we are a community that embraces it. So I guess my question really is kind of a two-parter. First, why aren't we more diverse in our leadership than we are now? And given that, how do we increase it? Well, Bill, I, I'm, not going to I'm not going to pretend to be the expert on being able to say how can we increase it. Um, I will, and, and, and I really don't know why we haven't really embraced it even though we publicize it um, the way we do. Um, I, I think it's a matter of, um, you know, once Barack Obama became president, I think everybody has gotten comfortable in this country. And so um, I think what we have to begin to take a look at is being able to talk about it openly, being able to have dialogue and conversation about it. I think that's how we begin to address it and begin to look at how we get it changed. I think uh, the growing number, again, as I said earlier, of companies that now have uh, diversity and inclusion um, leadership uh, within their company structures I think um, is, is, is a good start, and I think more and more you're going to see more efforts 
um, around that in this community. Again, based upon my limited time that I've been at the Columbus Urban League, um, I have been approached by um, numerous companies who say they want to come in and they want to figure out how they can become engaged with our organization. Um, so I, I just think it's one of those things that as a, as a country and as a city, you know, we have uh, an African American mayor. Um, and again, I think we get comfortable. So when we see one or two people in certain leadership positions um, that are of color or that is a, a woman, we get comfortable and we don't take a look at it, um, you know, just from a, a long-term perspective. So I, I think it's a matter of us figuring out how we can have conversations about that, um, do it in a thoughtful and respectful way. And um, my hope is that the Columbus Urban League might be, one, might be that entity that can begin to have those conversations with the business community. Jane Scott, um, I'm curious to know if you have observed some of the conflicts of policy that I have. Uh, Keith, you and I used to get frustrated on the Brewery District Commission in that we wanted to propose uh, restoration and density, but yet we were locked into certain zoning um, requirements for a number of parking spaces. I've been, um, I think it's comical or maybe it's frustrating as well. You know, up in the Clintonville area, they want to, their big fight on uh, uh, Northwest Broadway, that they want to tear down the 100-year-old trees to widen the road, but downtown we want to put a boulevard in Broad Street. And, you know, we run into these things all the time. When are our policies and our, our goals for our community going to align so that we're not in conflict uh, with one purpose versus another? I, I don't know that they'll ever align perfectly. Um, you know, it's, it's part of an evolution. We're evolving from the, the sort of planning thought from the mid-century, mid-20th century, and, and we haven't evolved all that quickly. Having said that, the city of Columbus has done some things that I, you know, I, I think it should be applauded for. I, the, you know, the urban commercial overlay district, which was passed um, in, in the late 80s, if, if you don't think that hasn't had an impact on, on High Street, um, you need to go drive it again, okay? The fact that that Kroger that got built in Short North is sitting there is because of that. Um, the the um, CVS and some of the other um, fast, fast feeders that are up and down High Street that have been brought out to the street, particularly around Lane and High, that's all a result of that, of that urban commercial overlay district. And I, I think the city deserves credit for that. And the second thing they did, which I really liked, was um, uh, they've now passed an ordinance for maximum parking spaces, which you know they should also be applauded for. I mean, it, and they did it. They did it in a smart way. They they sent airplanes up and checked uh, the day after Thanksgiving, you know, just how many cars, and they figured out how many parking spaces these retailers really do need, and and they began to establish a, a maximum um, parking uh, ratio, and and that was smart, um, and. So I think they're they're coming around. Having said that, you know, there's still some stuff left left from the '50s that um, that we have to overcome. Uh, this is I'm I'm Jim Coe. This is directed primarily to Ray, but all of you can chime in. Ray, would you consider a cover uh, a cover story slash poll in the near future? Something titled "What Is Our Swagger?" Mm. Because after hearing all this today, I don't disagree with a lot of it. However, the, 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 the point that was tied for number five, I think, about needing more things to do in this city, um, our swagger is we've got a lot of things to do already. Uh, there are nights that I am triple booked. You know, I have to make decisions on what I'm not going to be able to get to do because there's so many other things that I'm going to do. And I, I, I don't think I'm a lone voice in this room or in my community. So. Um, I don't know if Columbus Monthly has done that sort of a, uh, a survey yet, but uh, I'd enjoy reading one. <laughs> well, our March uh, issue is cover is open, and Jim, you have deadline of January 15th. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll talk after. Well, I think we've come to the end of the questions. Um, it's great to have such thoughtful people working on, on these issues and, and keeping them uh, on the agenda and, 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 and the focus that you all bring to it is terrific. As we close today, I want to encourage you to continue the conversation out in the lobby. We've got some, uh, some cookies and coffee. Uh, don't forget to sign up for next week, the college degree imperative. If you 
if you remember tomorrow at 11 o'clock in the morning to, call, to sign on uh, to the Columbus Foundation for the big give, the Metropolitan Club is on that list. <laughs> and we certainly would appreciate uh, your contributions. You know, it, there is a match that goes along with that. Um, I want to thank the Columbus Foundation for the uh, sponsorship of the series and our panelists, uh, Stephanie Hightower, Keith Myers, and our own board member, Walker Evans, and uh, our moderator, Ray Paparaki. Thanks all. Uh, <laughs> see you next week.